All right, hello. Let's go into the lab one assignment walkthrough. So what I'm gonna do here is pretend that I'm one of you, student in this class, wondering how exactly to uh, submit the assignment for lab one. So basically, uh, I'm going to open up an R Markdown document in an R project, and then I'm going to write stuff in there. I'm gonna solve all of the problems in the lab one uh, basics problem set at the bottom for the generalization assignments. And then I'm going to uh, submit it to GitHub. And once we do that, there's going to be a URL, a link to this GitHub repository. And um, you can take that link and copy it and submit it on Blackboard for your assignment. So I'm hoping that this will clarify all the things that I'm asking you to do. And also for lab one, um, if you are trying the, the different problems out yourself and you're running into problems, you can see how I solve them all. So I'm basically going to go and do and solve all of the problems in lab one. Um, so I encourage you to try to do these things on your own for this lab um, and uh, use this as a resource if you get stuck. Okay, so we should be flipped back into this bigger view. We're looking at lab one basics. Uh, we're going to go over this in class on Thursday. I created a video walkthrough of the whole lab right here. You can watch that as well. And we're going to go down on just so you know, we're at the course website. We're under uh, the labs to have lab one basics. We're going to go down to the lab one generalization assignment. And the instructions are to make a new R project create a new R Markdown document called lab1.rmd. And um, we want to upload uh, our uh, R project folder stats lab1 to github.com and basically create and use an a, a R Markdown document uh, to show your work while we solve these generalization problems, which are listed right here. All right, so here's how I would do that. Um, give me a second, I need to plug my computer in. All right, plugged in. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, go to our studio. I'm already in an R project, but we were asked to make a new one. And the name of that was Stats Lab One. Let's do it. New project. New project. I'm saving this in a directory I've got called Stats Class. I'm going to do Stats Lab One. Make sure you have Create a Git Repository checked. So I'm creating that. We did it. And the next step is to create a new R Markdown document called lab1.rmd. All right, let's do that. lab1.rmd, well, we'll just call it lab1 with, for the title. And then when we save this, I just pressed Command S, lab1, we can, well, we can just call it lab1 actually. And it will save as a .rmd file. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and delete the template there. So we're starting off with a fresh, uh, empty R Markdown document. Now, the first thing I wanna do is get this on GitHub. Uh, that's the third thing, upload this project to github.com using GitHub Desktop. Okay, so I'm going to uh, open up GitHub Desktop. And I'm going to add an existing repository. I'm choosing, I need to go find this on my computer. It's in the stats class folder, here it is. And we call it stats lab one. So I'll open, add, and there we go. We just added the repository. It should, uh, you should see it in your list here. Uh, there it is. Now, since we, created this repository, 
we added some files into it and there those are changes that are reflected there i'm just gonna make a commit first commit commit to master and now i want to put it up on github so i'm going to say publish repository and i want everyone else to see this so i'm going to uncheck the box and then we're going to make this public and then click publish repository There it is. And you can check that it's there by clicking the view on GitHub button. And we could see that I've got a stats lab repository with these files in it. Here's my lab1.rmd. It's empty. And uh, if I was to click this URL here, right, I would um, be able to submit that on Blackboard. And uh, sorry, you would do that. And I would get your link and I could go to your repository and look at your work here. So let's get on with it and complete the assignment. So if I was doing this, I would probably have my RStudio set up just like this and I'd be looking at lab1.rmd, it's blank. Now I'm going to go back to the website and I'm going to copy all of this stuff here. Because what I wanna do Oh, there's some ugly stuff. This is mildly annoying, but I'm just separating out these questions. So here's question number one, compute the sum of the sequence 100 to 1000. There's question number two. There's question number three, number four. Uh, and number five, and here's number six. All right, I just wanted to set up my document and I'm just gonna delete a few more things. I don't think we need this stuff here. All right, I press knit just to, just to see what I'm working with and I've got uh, a little document set up where I could see what I'm doing. Now make sure you put your name as the author and let's get started. So to complete this assignment, what I wanna see is you showing your work to solve each of the problems. So let's start with problem number one and it says compute the sum of the sequence 100 to 1000 going up by a constant value of 100. Here's the sequence right here, all right? Uh, so I'm going to do that in R. Uh, there's a couple ways I could do that, and it's totally okay for you to demonstrate that you can do this in more than one way. So the first way I'm going to do it is I'm going to use the sum function, and now I need to get these numbers into here as a vector. Now I can't just put them in here like this and press play because, oh, I guess I can. I didn't know that. Interesting. <laughs> I thought that I needed to put them just like this inside of the C command to combine them into a vector. So this certainly does work. Um, let's do it another way. I know that I can create a sequence uh, from 100 to 1000 going up by 100 using the seek command. And so I could also sum this up just like that. So that'd be two ways to do it. All right, we're done with problem number one. Let's move on. Problem number two, compute the sum of these numbers. All right, well, this is kind of the same as what we did before. And I just want to make sure I've got all the right parentheses. And looks like the sum is 96, great. So far, I can press play and make this one work. I can press play and make this code chunk work. So I'm gonna press knit and we'll see that we're adding the, the code chunks and the outputs to our document so we can read it uh, as a HTML as well. And by the way, you might've been wondering, oh, how am I setting up these code chunks? Well, I'm using a hotkey, so let's go to number three. I'm just pressing option command I I'm on a Mac, so it automatically makes this thing. You can write it out by hand. One, two, three, back ticks, left curly brace R, 
right curly brace, and then three more back ticks. And you make what I like to think of as a code sandwich. And we can put our R code inside here. Uh, at some point, I'll try to figure out what the hotkey for Windows is. It's probably Control, Option I, maybe like that. Try it out. So let's write a custom sequence generator function using a for loop that generates a sequence from a starting integer value to an ending integer value in steps of one, and then demonstrate that it can produce the sequence one to 10. So earlier in the lab, we seen some examples of writing a function and we wrote a sum function. So let's see if, if we can write a sequence uh, generator function. I'm gonna give it the name seq generator. And what I'm gonna do as I start out, I'm just going to create an empty function. And we're gonna kind of go along as we, as we, we're gonna test it out Basically, oh, sorry, I'm gonna talk about what I'm doing as I add things one at a time. So if we were to do this, press play here, in our environment, we'll see that uh, we've created a function called seek underscore generator, and it doesn't do anything. So if we were to run this function, uh, nothing would happen. So it returns a null. Now we want to create a custom sequence generator that can generate a sequence from a, a starting value. So we're going to need some kind of input that defines the starting value. And we need a, an ending value. And uh, that's basically it. So I just, cr I just made up these words start and end. They're reasonable because they refer to think the beginning and the, the beginning number and the final number. Now, um, when I have inputs, uh, basically what's going to happen is that anything that goes into these values will become available later on in the function. I wonder if this would be helpful to, to just um, write this out here. So we're writing function. And we've got start and end. Uh, whoops, I'm gonna do that one more time. Sorry. Function, we've got start, comma, end, and then we've got the curly brace, and we've got another curly brace. So basically, anything that's in the middle here is where we can receive inputs. Um, and then work with them. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, after we define this function, we're later going to use it, just like right here. This would be an example of using the function. And when we use the function, we want to define some inputs. We might want to say start equals one and end equals five. And, and then see what happens. So here, nothing is going to happen. Oh. It's, we're getting an error. Error in seek generator start equals one. It's unused arguments. Now we have to recompile this. So our function now has those two inputs. Now we can run it. We get a null, and that's because nothing's happening. We're effectively putting in the numbers one into this start variable and the number five into this end variable, but nothing happens in the function. So nothing gets returned. Right. If I wanted to return the start and the end values, potentially just like this in a little vector, uh, ah, this would do something now. So I've added some meat inside the function and all that happens is it returns whatever is assigned to the start variable and whatever is assigned to the end variable. So if we change this to 10 and six, you know, it's going to return a 10 and a 6, or a 100 and a 60. There we go. So it's a way to, um, when, uh, whenever we put in inputs, we can assign them and then make use of those things inside the function. 
So now that we understand that, maybe, I'm going to leave this at one equals five. And what I wanna do is, I mean, we could do this pretty simply, actually. This, this function doesn't need to be very complicated. It does ask us to use a for loop. Now, let me just show you a way to do it without a for loop. It would be just this simple. We already know that using the colon notation, uh, we can have, uh, this will generate a sequence. So if we put a number like one colon five, uh, we're gonna get a sequence one to five. If the word start and the word end were names of variables that contained the number one and five, then this would happen too. So for example, if we recompile this function and then run it, we get a sequence generator that will create a sequence between any starting number and any st uh, ending number. And this is all it took. All right. Actually, I'm just going to um, make a comment without a for loop. So that works. Now I'm gonna make another comment with a for loop. Let's see if we can make one where we use a for loop. And I suspect we can do that. And I'm just gonna copy my code and I'm gonna set up a loop. And I'm gonna say for i in start colon end. And then, well, we could do this. We could say print i. And if we did this, what's gonna happen? We're going to print the values between 10 and 50, so that worked. Um, oh, actually, I see that the, uh, the question was asking me to produce the sequence one to 10. So let's change these things so it actually does produce the sequence one to 10, and this one, one to 10. All right, so, uh, this could be an acceptable answer, and it solves the problem. I'm going to do, do it one more way, just because I'd rather um, put the output of this function into a variable. So I'm going to create a temporary variable called sequence, and this is starts out as an empty vector. And for each step of the sequence, I'm going to place into it the value of i. Now, this is going to do something kind of uh, interesting, you'll see. Let's do this. Seek generator, and then run that. Uh, oh, so it looks like nothing happened here. We need to return the 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 contents of sequence. Um, so let's run that again, run this, and it works. Now let's try going from 10 to 15. See, this is an interesting thing that happened here. The first nine numbers are NA, and then the last five, or I guess it's six from 10 to 15, they are all the values 10 to 15. And it's kind of curious to pause and look and wonder, why is this happening? And let's just do that really quickly, pause and wonder about that. So in this case, the start and end values are 10 to 15. And that means I in the loop will take on the value 10, then 11, then 12, then 13, then 14, then 15, right? Sequence is a empty vector. It starts out with nothing in it. And on the very first step of the loop, we take and we assign into the position of the first value of i, which is a 10. We assign into position 10 the, first, the value of i, which is a 10. So what happens is we, uh, we basically 
take an empty vector that has nothing in it, and then we go all the way to the 10th position and put a 10 in. That causes all the other ones to be not in numbers because we never put anything in there yet. So in uh, to solve this problem and get rid of the NAs, we need to keep track of um, both the position that we want to enter a number into as well as the uh, starting and stopping parts of the sequence. So in other words, we want to put 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 into positions 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 of the vector. We've already got something set up uh, to create the, the numbers 10 to 15, but we don't have something set up to create the numbers 1 to 6. And there's a couple ways we can do this. For example, it uh, we could do, let's just try to be very explicit. We're going to create our sequence, and the sequence is, um, this is going to be kind of silly, but uh, the sequence we want to create goes from the starting value to the ending value. The positions we want to fill, they go from one to the length of the sequence. So we compute the length of the sequence here. In this case, it'll be six. Then we can say for i in positions, which is going to be position one, position two, position three, and so on. What we want to do, actually we need to make a third one. Let's call it computed sequence. And this is a empty vector. Now we're going to go through each of the positions, one, two, three, four, five, six, and assign into those positions in this empty vector. The value inside the sequence at that same position. And then we can return the computed sequence. So all of this I think should work. Ah, I got an error and I was being a little bit lazy. Up here I defined computed sequence without an S and here I add an S. So I'm just going to redo this. All right, so that works. Spent a little extra time on that one and let's go on to problem number four. But before I do that, I just wanna check that everything will knit. So I'm gonna click knit. Yep, it's knitting. All right, so let's write a custom function to implement the following general equation to find the sum of any constant series. Demonstrate that your function correctly produces the sum for the series below. All right, well, we're talking about this equation right here. And let me just pull this over here. Move this, move this. and uh, analytic, I'm gonna call this uh, analytic sum. And it's a function and it has uh, x1 variable and an xn variable and a step variable. Those are the inputs to the function. And here's the definition. So basically, I'm going to, inside here, I'm just gonna create a temporary variable called the sum. I mean, I could actually do all this in one line probably. And I'll do an example of that in a moment. And the first thing I wanna do is uh, write down xn minus x1. So xn minus x1. 
and I want to divide that by the step value or C. Now we're going to add some parentheses for operator precedence. That'll make sure that this subtraction occurs and then we divide by step. Now we want to take all of this and add one, but we want to make sure that all of this gets computed before we add one. So we're adding another set of parentheses. All right. Now we want to take this whole thing, referring to the stuff inside this parentheses right here, and we want to multiply it by the stuff on the other side. So all of this stuff requires yet another set of parentheses around them. And then we can hit the star and get a, a multiply, and then we have to write the other side here. So I'm going to start out and just write those two parentheses. And then we want to do x1 plus xn. I already know we need parentheses for that, so I added some more. x1 plus xn. And we want to divide that by 2. All right. And there we have it. So we can then return this value. Return, oops, comma, the underscore sum. Press play. Now let's try it out. So analytic, and notice I started typing the function and it kind of auto completes for me. So I want to define x1 to be uh, 10, xn is going to be 100, and step is going to be 10. And let's run this function. It works and we get the correct answer 550. Um, let's just demonstrate that that gives us the same as doing it like this. Yep, so it uh, seems to work pretty well. I'll do one more example of a one-liner. So we don't need to return this. We could get rid of these curly braces, because basically what we want to do is run all of this uh, when we do this function. And I think, are we, doesn't like that for some reason, it's giving me an X. Um, but that should be okay. I guess we could put the braces there. Oh, I need to save the document. Um, actually, we don't need the braces there, I don't think. Sometimes, oh, I guess we do. Hmm. Let's do it. Braces. All right. And I'll just check that this does work. There we go. And knit the document again. And all right, so now we've seen the solution, some solutions to problem number four. Okay, number five, write a custom function that generates a constant series between any start and end values with any constant and finds the sum. Have your function output both the sequence and the sum. For this problem, feel free to use the existing seek and sum functions in your custom function. Demonstrate the function correctly prints out the above sequence, 10 to 100 and steps to 10 and its sum. All right, we should be able to make use of some of the things we've learned and put this together. Now, basically what we're doing is something like this. We wanna create a sequence between any, um, two numbers by any constant value, and we can use the seek function to do that. And we want to, um, well, I guess we want to do two things. First of all, we want to create the sequence and print it, and we want to find the sum of that sequence. So we want to do both of these things, but we want to do it in the context of a custom function where we could supply any of these uh, numbers ourselves. So I'm going to call this function um, sum underscore seek. We're going to assign it a function. And the inputs will be start, end, and step. 
And uh, first of all, let's create the sequence. So the sequence will be seq, start value, end value, step value. And then the sum will be the sum of the sequence. Now I want to return both of these things. So a good way to do that is to return everything as a list. And in this case, I'm going to create a, a variable called my output, and it's going to contain something called a list. And in this list, I'm going to give some names. So the first name is going to be the sequence, and it's going to equal the variable sequence. And then I'm going to write the name, the sum, and it's going to equal, or let's give it sum, and it's going to equal the sum. And then we will return my output. So let's try this. Uh, let's run the function. And we're asked to try 10 to 100 in steps of 10. So we can go 10, 100, 10, and see what happens. All right. So this is one way that we could solve this problem, where we're outputting both a uh, sequence and the sum. And using the list format, we're able to uh, output different kinds of information. So the first one is a vector, the second one is just a single value, and we can, and they represent different things. One's a sequence, one's a sum, and we can give them both names. So this can be convenient because if we're, for example, let's create a variable A, and let's say we put this stuff in there, that would show up in our global environment just like this, a list of two, and we can go in there and check out these different things. Then we can access them as well. So A uh, with the list, you have to do, and we'll talk about lists in more detail um, in another lecture. Uh, when you have a list, you use two square brackets, and then you can start looking at things inside of it. So we can see that inside of it is the sequence, and that's this, and also sum. So those are two ways you can access the contents of that list. All right, I think I will stop there for now and go on to problem six. Use the sum and the length functions to calculate the mean of the numbers one, two, three, four, five. All right, that's pretty straightforward. We've got x. We're going to assign these numbers to x. And then we're going to calculate the sum of x, divide by the length of x, and that should do it. There we have it. OK, so I've walked through completing the assignment. And uh, here's my R Markdown document. I've knitted it, so in my Stats Lab 1 project folder. I should have this RMD file. This shows all my work. I've got the lab one HTML file that I can open up. I can view it in a web browser just like this. And as, as you might imagine, we made a whole bunch of changes to this file and to the HTML file in this project. So when we go back to GitHub desktop, we'll see uh, that there are some changes here, and uh, we need to commit them. I'm just going to say finished assignment one. I'm going to commit to master, and those changes have now been saved in my history. And now I want to push them up to GitHub so that they appear up on github.com. And we could go uh, check that out. This was before I pushed my new stuff here, so let's check it out now. And you can see that 
we've got uh, lab1.rmd here, and it's got all my work. So I've successfully completed assignment one and saved all my work on my local computer and put it up on GitHub. The last thing I would do is copy this URL into the lab one assignment on Blackboard and submit it, and you're done. Now, um, so uh, you can feel free to basically copy my work uh, as a way to uh, finish your assignment. I didn't mention this, but a good goal to have is being able to press knit and have your entire document compile. Um, oh, actually, you know what? This is maybe a final thing to say. Let's go back here. If you have an error somewhere in your R Markdown document, let's say there's an error right here. Who knows what it is? Maybe you've got some stuff like this that doesn't make sense. So if you press play here, you'll get that error. Well, when you try to knit your document, it won't work because there will be an error. And you can do a few different things if you want to. I mean, it's totally fine if, if you don't get through this and you make a bunch of errors. That's part of the process. You still have to hand something in. So uh, one thing you can do is go into this these curly braces and you can um, set error equals true to a particular code chunk. When you do that, it will ignore the error and it will just print out and it will allow you to compile the document. So that's one little trick you could use. And we'll talk about more tricks with R Markdown as we go throughout the, the lecture or the, the whole semester. All right, so that's it for now. And uh, it's Wednesday. We'll see you tomorrow on Thursday for the very first class. Thank mm -hmm. you.